Open grazing in Nigeria has since been a source of conflict and crisis, leading to the loss of lives and environmental degradation. Now, these are some of the issues as regards the idea of open grazing. Now, desertification and depletion of environmental assets, loss of fertile soil, clean water, <coughs> forest, and biodiversity. Also, conflict between farmers and headers as violence and killing destruction of agricultural produce is commonplace. Now, to combat these issues, many states in the country have enacted laws to prohibit open grazing and establish ranches. Now, tensions ran high as the bill to ban open grazing successfully passed its second reading in the Nigerian Senate. Recently, if enacted, this bill will finally prohibit open grazing nationwide, aiming to resolve long-standing conflicts between headers and farmers. Now joining me on the program, live in the studio, is Biodun Shoumi. He's a public affairs analyst from Nigeria. And of course, I have uh, Zari Yusuf, a social justice advocate and social political analyst, joining from the Federal Capital Territory. Gentlemen, thank you for being with me on the conversation. Thank you for having me. All right, great. Let me start off with you. Uh, immediately, Biodun, there are a lot of, you know, long-standing issues as regards open grazing. And we know that um, this is not the first time a national conversation around it, you know, has happened. But it looks like the Senate this time around is pretty uh, definitive as to finding a lasting solution. Uh, what is your reaction with uh, uh, what transpired on the floor of the Senate concerning the passage of the bill? And if at all the objective or the idea uh, to ban it is really a way forward. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we, we are forced to come to terms with reality mm. of the effect of um, open grazing. Many people have been speaking about it, people have campaigned about it, some state governments have uh, taken actions against open grazing. Some of them, you know, lip service, um, uh, just banning it um, without actually enforcing it. Um, we've seen all that throughout your country, but not ever have we witnessed the shortage of food and spike in food um, prices in the last, uh, that has happened in the last one year. Till now, we've never gone to that level. We've seen how food supply inflation could influence the headline, you know, the baseline inflation to the extent of food supply inflation. So are, are you suggesting that uh, the scarcity of food or the food insecurity being experienced can be linked to activities of open Absolutely. grazing? Absolutely. That's where I'm going. I will tell you the four problems with um, open grazing. Mm. So we've seen the effect in the last one year uh, to two years, the disturbance of um, uh, farming. We've, we are now beginning to reap, you know, the reward in terms of uh, food supply uh, problems now driving inflation in the country. The the, the food inflation is 40.5 percent, whereas the baseline inflation is still about 34 point something percent. Mm. So therefore, we are paying a heavy price. So it's now it has now dawned on our legislators, on our senators, and everybody that something has to be done if we don't have to depend on importation of food. Now, um, one of the major problems created by um, open grazing it's the security issues, the security problem. We've seen how it has led to clashes between nomadic farmers, you know, and um, uh, the cattle rearers and the farmers, mm. you know, the crop farmers, to the extent that many farms were, several thousands of hectares were destroyed, you know, eaten by cattle, and then we've, it has led to clashes, people have died, so many people. We've seen retaliation, attacks, and all that, and that's driven many farmers away from the farm particularly in the bread, bread uh, producing basket of the nation in the middle belt. So we've seen this problem. Now uh, it has gotten to a situation where we are now very short of many things. A lot of what we are consuming in Nigeria today in terms of pepper, tomato, are coming from neighboring countries. Uh, in Niger Republic, Bene Republic, uh, th these are the sources you know, of um, what we are eating today. So of course we have to pay the price of it, the cost of logistics of moving them down to um, our towns and cities means that they, they will now mm. become so exorbitant. So it's the shortage of food supply caused by the clashes between um, cattle herders and farmers, you know, the security problems created that has led to this situation. That is one. The second issue with open grazing is the issue of um, desertification, particularly in the semi 
arid region of uh, part of the country. You cannot do open grazing without causing the certification. Therefore, you will now have more land which are not farmable in terms of uh, for crops purposes. So we are beginning to see the increasing effect of the certification in our country, particularly in the northern part of the country. And that is why you see the cattle others again now drifting towards the south. The other issue is the issue of um, uh, the greenhouse effect, you know, caused by open grazing. That's a major problem. It's a climate issue which we have signed up to international treaty to reduce, you know, um, some of these problems. So, but we are not helping ourselves through uh, open grazing. And you also have the pollution of water, mm. you know, by um, uh, the, the feces from uh, the cattle because it has methane in it. It generates methane. So when it gets into the water, it pollutes the water. They are no longer fit for human consumption. So these are some of the problems. There is no business. There is no real reason to do open grazing in Nigeria. Even if you are to say because it is cheaper, farmers don't have to. They cut you others. Don't have to buy the grass. After all, the grass are growing and then they can eat in it. Abundance. The, the, the fact of the problem mm. is it's still not a justification because they destroy farms. Even when we are, they eat the grass, they pollute the water because they will need water. They will go to the river and then they will pollute the water which the rural people are drinking. Mm. So in my view, and when you look at the long hundreds of miles those cattle will walk, the milk, the output from them in, in terms of meat, in terms of milk, it's always very low compared to those uh, which are not openly great. So, therefore, there's no justification to continue. Okay, you, you, uh, you, you, you've made some uh, really uh, uh, pivotal points here, particularly linking it to uh, food scarcity. I I'd like to go to Zari now. I'll come back to you, Biodun. Okay. Zari, I, I would like to know your opinion on this, particularly you know, on some of the things that uh, Biodun said here, linking uh, food uh, scarcity to activities uh, you know, of uh, open grazing. What's your take? Well, let me begin by saying, um, <clears throat> when you speak about, I think I've been to quite a number of affected uh, areas, anyway, the southern Kaduna Plateau, and I can tell you for uh, about a decade or more, uh, close to between uh, 27 to 40 percent of the farmlands are not being cultivated and then quite a number of farmlands that are being cultivated either cannot be harvested or um, right maybe at the start or the middle of the farming season, uh, cows will eat them up. Now the major problem is, and I think uh, much as it impacts on you know, food production, you know, the scarcity of food, uh, the hiking of the prices, there is a far more dangerous dimension to it than uh, uh, you know just the normal uh, clashes that you would naturally have between uh, herders and farmers. Um, at least for the past decade, if you would look at the manner of uh, you know killings, uh, the overrunning of communities, uh, I think uh, sometime back a couple of months I was in Benue, uh, a part local government. And I access, I think, about four communities that were completely deserted. And uh, I had to even survive one particular uh, ambush by the same people. So um, it's not just a matter of farmer header clashing, basically. The whole, whole idea of the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the cattle route was a problem imposed on Nigeria right from when it was the regional, uh, you know, government. So uh, a certain kind of lifestyle was meant to be preserved, regardless of how it impacted people, especially those that do not share, uh, you know, backgrounds such as cultural or religious. And then people created a certain route. So that gave a certain sense of entitlement to people. So you could leave uh, Futujalon, you could leave Mali, you could leave Chad, you could come in with your petal. And because there was a law that made it appear like, okay, this particular route belong to these people. Virtually everything they find there, they eat it. Uh, <coughs> if you stand in their way, they kill you and all of that. Now, so uh, what we have now, especially with regards to the beef, a lot of people just talk about banning open grazing, banning open grazing, and people get carried away with it. But they, primarily, that's not primarily what the beef is addressing. It's trying to create another 
scenario where we may have to face a bigger problem, which is the establishment of uh, of uh, a national uh, ranching, uh, you, you know, commission. Mm. Uh, and in the course of our conversation, you would realize that uh, to a large extent, there is a mistake initially that was made. An example is, um, let's talk, for instance, the what we refer to, just to digress a little, something referred to the uh, National Commission for Nomadic Education. Now, every, every Nigerian child is entitled to being educated. But when it came to the uh, nomads, rather than integrate into what the country has, the equal opportunity the country has provided for everybody, some people, because of the power of those uh, sentimental to them, rather I would now create a certain kind of uh, uh, special, uh, special provision for the nomads. And when you look at, say, for instance, uh, the Yoruba, uh, the Igbo, the Thieves, and all of that, they all have their traditions, a lot of which have either been outlawed or they've modified out of it because civilization is changing and people integrate into it. So how do you, you know, create a scenario where uh, there was a cattle route and, and then you pass to somebody's village and you say the government made it a cattle route and all of that and then the clashes began. But for the time being, it is less about farmers and herders. It has served more as a cover where Islamists, basically terrorists, have uh, pursued some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an expansionist agenda. So, you wait, if, if I'm to get you correctly, uh, Zari, you were going a bit, a bit yes. further. You're saying that uh, uh, maybe all of this might just be a facade to something deeper that's, and that's more right. sinister. That's right. Okay. That's we, right. We, now, we, let me put it this way. Hmm. In 2018, uh, the then governor of Kano State, uh, Alhaji uh, Omar Ganduji, uh, invited all of the cattle herders, especially when the heat was high in Benue, where you had hundreds of killings and all of that, massacres. He said, come to Kano. There is a, a region in Kano, at Fulgore, the Fulgore Forest. It's a, it's a reserve. It's, it borders with four local governments in Kano. And mm -hmm. it will take millions of, of, of cattle herders and, and their cows and everything. And there are provisions for social amenities, schools, and all of that. So if you believe you, your life is tied around the tax, then we have made provisions for education. We've made provisions for hospitals. Every social amenity was made available. The response of, uh, I think, what do you call them? Uh, the the Magban, you know, Mieti Allah, was that much as it was a noble offer, they will not take it. And the reason they advanced was simply because the Thief people also live in Kano. That's Magban looking at uh, the ones in Benue. That the Thief people live in Kano, they live in Sokoto, they live in Lagos, they live everywhere, and mm. nobody is sending them back home. So they are not going back. They are staying, which simply means if you claim it is the interest, basically what takes rather from, from say, Mali or Chad down south to Benue, is because you want to feed your cow, you want, you want to boom your business. There is an offer for you to come and enjoy, almost free, on, on people's tax, you know, on, the, on taxpayers' money. But they rejected it. And that is the reason why it is my belief that it is less about rearing cattle, less about farmer head at flesh, and more about the use of it for an expansionist, uh, uh, you know, agenda. I, 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 I hope I, in the course of our conversation we look at more. I mean, uh, uh, Zari, uh, thank you for that. But, you know, uh, so, some might just want to say maybe that's uh, within the realms of conspiracy theory. But uh, let me... No, 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 no. No, it's not. There are facts to cover that up. There are facts to cover that up. It's not mm. just a conspiracy theory. Okay, there you have the facts. Uh, it's, yes, a scenario where you have, for the past 10 years, if, if I would, I could take you to a number of mass graves in southern Kaduna and Benue <coughs> and on the plateau, <coughs> And I can assure you that you remember in May 2023, there were about there was a night where, in a matter of hours, about 400 people were killed with sophisticated arms. You would find on the black communities that have been sacked, and some of them, even the names, have been changed. I don't right. know if you hear what I'm saying. Uh, of course, I'm following you. But, but you know what, Zari? Let, let, let me. Refugee camps and all of, so it's not a conspiracy theory. Mm. They, these are facts. All right. Okay? Uh, uh, and that's the reason why when the people cry out, we, we tend to prefer to just maintain it as farmer had that flesh. But it's not it. 
not okay. with the sophisticated arms and not with the uh, uh, the toll of killings, the massacres. I mean, uh, the, the person at the forefront of this push is actually even, a, 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 as we understand, a, a Christian in terms of faith. But uh, let's... Let's move to, uh, let me leave oh, you for yeah, a moment. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the more reason. That's let, the more, let, sorry, let me, I'm let not me, interrupting you, but, but that's okay. the more reason why we have to be extremely cautious about it, because whatever it contains mm. doesn't deviate so much from Buhari's initial, uh, 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 you know, what had been resource, the Ruga resource and all of that. And they've been talking about uh, open, burning open grazing, burning open grazing. It doesn't really say much about burning open okay. grazing. Okay, just Z about Z it, Z Zari, Zari, let, let me leave you for a moment. Uh, let me, of course, allow Jordan <coughs> to react to any of the things you know you, you feel he has said. And uh, but more importantly, also let's uh, look at um, some of the controversies uh, surrounding this particular issue, the open grazing idea itself, even the bill. Now we have, just like you said, ethnic and religious tensions. You know, uh, federalism and also the rights of states are also involved in all of this as concerns, cultural heritage, the grazing routes, and also the economic concerns and rights of citizens and also political tensions amongst, you know, a plethora of other issues. I I'd like you to also, you know, uh, address some of these issues. And if at all, uh, the bill itself is from a place of sincerity or just like what Zari uh, Ria said, uh, is a facade to something more sinister. Um, well, um, let me first address what... Um uh, Zari is trying to, or highlighted, let me illuminate it a bit. Yes, there could be credible reasons to think that maybe um, some people are exploiting these, you know, for um, their own purposes, uh, particularly um, um, terrorists or bandits. That's possible. Um, there's credible evidence, you know, to suggest that. But beyond that, and far before then, there had always been a major problem. We used to have what they call West African Grazing Reserve route all over West Africa. And that has been the route being used in the past. So over a period of time, we had problems of desertification, again caused, largely caused by climate change and largely caused you know, by grazing. But um, the cattle breeders continued to move along the whole West African road. It's not just in Nigeria. They move across down to Nigeria and then move further towards where there is water and where the plants are green. And in the process, they do not care about whether they are crops or not. As far as they are concerned, they want their cow to get fed. So along over a period of time, farms have been built across that route. Roads have been constructed across that route. Towns and villages have expanded across that route. They have a particular route that they follow. That is the truth of this problem. And because of that, and because the land, that West African Grazing Reserve route was never purchased by anybody. Nobody was paid for it. No government was paid for it. It was just created during the colonial era. And therefore, that created a major problem. Mm. So given that situation, you have some of these cattle breeders are not necessarily bandits. They have people who are genuinely cattle breeders who are concerned that, look, that is the route to how we get is the reserve route. That's the so route they know. They know. It's their reserve route as far as they are concerned. They do not care about ownership, about the law in your country, whether the law says it's the state government that owns the land or federal government. They are not bothered about that because this is an inherited problem from colonial era. And therefore, they chose to continue on that path. Now, the, the, the point that he is also making could as well be true that given the tension and the problems in the country, we have seen that bandit seems to be more active in areas where those cattle are being bred, you know, uh, they, they, they are being graced, mm. you know, openly. We've seen, you know, towns and villages being destroyed and attempts to change the names of those places. These have been widely reported. But these are the facts of the matter. And the only way to stop it is to stop open grazing and then go ranching. Ghana had to stop them at uh, the cattle breeders, you know. You cannot do what they're doing here in Benin Republic. What the cattle breeders are doing, many people think they are Nigerians. They are, most of them are not Nigerians. They move. It's their lifestyle. They move 
from one place to the other, you know, right down towards Mauritania, to Niger Republic, to Mali, and then again, when is the season, they start moving backwards. So these are the facts of the matter. And if we don't stop this problem, we will continue to create food shortage problem in our country. Mm. And that's the, the way I see it in line with um, what um, Zari said. Now, the other aspect is um, of your question. Uh, the, uh, talking about, uh, of course, uh, the idea, I mean, uh, enforcement the, challenges, particularly yes, for states. The enforcement challenges and um, the opposition by some yes. elements within the Nigerian um, country. The, the fact of the matter is enforcement is better done through education, orientation. Mm. We need to orientate them. Most of these cattle breeders are not educated. They do not understand Turinchi English. They do not understand what we're talking about. Even some of them cannot speak another language apart from Fufude. And they are not integrated socially. We should not forget they live in the bush, they follow the animal through the bush down to whatever they're sending them and then back. So, therefore, they, we need to look for a way to engage them. But why do I you know, think many of them, I mean, we understand the aspect of enlightenment and education, but why is, do we have a scenario where quite a number of them feel that they are entitled, you know, to whatever it is they do? Many even feel they are above the law. I mean, they move around with uh, sophisticated weapons, you know, uh, kill and you know, no, no sign of remorse. That's for those that, that you know, have been, have been uh, found, you know, to, to have done such. So uh, why is that? Uh, why that's, the infantry? That's a long history. If you are to do that, we won't finish that discussion in three hours. Um, you, we, you'll have to go back to the era and the days of Futa Jalon. But let me just quickly mention what happened in Central African Republic, you know, by the same people, you know, the AVOC, uh, they created in Central African Republic to the extent that um, it led when Utopia was in power and then people had to rise up and trying to avoid using ethnic or mm. religious same thing. You know, had to rise up and drove Utopia away. President Utopia fled and then a new leadership emerged and most of those people left mm. uh, Central African Republic. They moved to Mali where they created, you know, another uh, chaos you know, going on in Mali, and then we've seen evidence, credible evidence, you know, to suggest that they're also spreading and fueling what is going on in the northern part of Nigeria. Mm. So um, it's not just about whether um, they think they have the, the uh, what do they call it, the infantry. They've never had a country. This is the truth. So they have been moving from one place to the other, they are living in one. Look, we had a president in this country who went to Mali and announced that all banners uh, of people, you know, particularly uh, the president actually mentioned the word Fulani, are uh, entitled to live in Nigeria. You know, he said it in Mali, mm. uh, from our president. Mm. So that gave an impetus, and people think, oh, yes, you know, it, it emboldened people the more, and they thought they could move into any country and do what they like. All right. Uh, let me leave you for a moment, Biodon. Let me go back to you, Zari. I mean, uh, talking about ranching, which, of course, has been proposed as a, a solution or an alternative to open grazing. I mean, it's a standard practice uh, in many countries across the world. We know that in the U.S., for instance, some people are, are called the cowboys. You know, even though we see them in movies as glamorized, as, you know, actors who you know, fight the valiance and all of that. But the, the, the origin of it is these guys are farmers. They, 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 they own ranches and, of course, they control the pasture and all of that. So, I mean, ranching is almost standard practice everywhere. But right now you're saying that um, uh, everyone should be cautious of this uh, uh, bill or this move because of uh, perceived expansionist agenda and also tribal and uh, cultural, uh, well, I call it uh, uh, ticking time bombs, if, if I'm to use that word. So uh, what do you suggest as an alternative? Okay, yes, indeed, ranching is the way out, but not what is being proposed. What is being proposed uh, is a scenario where, um, let, me, let me make this analogy, perhaps it would help. 
When you go down southwest, you find the Yorubas farming cocoa. When you come to Benue, you find Tig doing the yam. When you come to Southern Kituna, you find people, uh, uh, you know, rearing their pigs. When you go to the plateau, you find people doing all kinds of businesses. Certain kinds of uh, trades or transactions that they could claim, at least for the past six, seven, ten, or sometimes even 20 generations past, has been their practice. Whether it's pigry, whether it's uh, Irish potato, or what, whatever it may be. Now, those are things that the people, an example is how, what sense would it make to you if we woke up in the morning and we wanted to set up a commission for Yoruba Koko farmers, a federal commission, where your wealth, my wealth, my own commonwealth is going there just to cater for a particular people in the country. Now the question is, what are they basically, what are they contributing to the economy of the country? A private business cannot be adopted. You can't, a government, a state government should not adopt the liability of a particular ethnic group, their private business, and make it a liability on every other individual. For instance, uh, to just on a lighter mood to make these examples, for instance, certain traits that we know are common with, say, e-books, for instance, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, whether car parts, and all of that. What sense would it make if you hear a story tomorrow that 60 people were killed in Sokoto? And what is the reason? Because they decided to sell parts that the e-books felt is their entitlement only to sell. What sense would it make if you came to Kaba and realized that 130 people were killed by some Yorubas from uh, Ibadan simply because they attempted to farm cocoa in where the Yorubas felt was their entitlement to raise cocoa plants? So what I'm trying to say is this. Banning, of, as a matter of fact, open grazing should not just be banned. It should be outlawed. It should be proscribed. And I'm saying proscribed because tens of thousands, if not hundreds, thousands of lives have been lost just in the middle belt alone under that guys. And we, we've had groups that have taken responsibility for that such as it and that. Now you have asked questions quite about the sense of entitlement. Going further with this bill particularly, equally buttresses that sense of entitlement where uh, you and I will have to buy a lot of land to build our homes. Of course we come from villages if I didn't come from the village, my father came from the village where possibly he crossed one or two rivers without a shoe, got educated possibly to class seven, got married, raised me up, and then put me through school and all of that. So there is no people, there is no people that have actually been prepared awaiting civilization. We've had, when you see mountains in the Middle Belt, our ancestors interacted with all kinds of spirits there. So some practices at some point were outlawed because religion came, civilization came, and all of that. Mm. But then a certain group of people decided we will not live this lifestyle. Nobody is saying don't read it. Nobody is saying don't get educated. Nobody is saying don't live here. But take responsibility for what you are doing. So basically, the, the way I, I can't remember their names, but their belief is that, uh, and, uh, you know, their gods gave them uh, cows. I can't remember where they, they are not flooding. So virtually everywhere they see a cow in the world, uh, it belongs to them traditionally. So it would have created a problem if government adopted that, and I'm sorry to, well, I'm not sorry to use the word, but that barbaric uh, mindset and incorporated it into constitution. It was in the 50s that the Northern Nigerian region created that concept of petal route, which simply meant that if they were in this particular ranch, they will follow this particular path or route to go mm. to another ranch and feed their cattle. All right. Now, people have advanced. I live in a village. I know who owns that land. I know the people that own that place. I know the border we share with the neighboring community and all of that. But somebody felt that a law has been made for him to do that. So, I, and I love the fact that you mentioned it was even a Christian from the Middle Belt that proposed that deal. And that is the reason why we should question it more. Mm. An example is... Being from the Middle Belt, especially from Benue, he should have had a clear understanding. And, and I'm sorry to suspect, I don't know if he actually read the content that we just presented, but it's quite dangerous. An example is the commission will determine the number of branches in every state. 
how do you determine what a pastoralist state is and what it is not? An example is I can't refer to Plateau State as a pastoralist state. I will refer to it as a state where pastoralists have killed tens of thousands of people. But it's not a pastoralist state. You've got the Ngas in their area, you've got the Piron, you've got the Morvu, you've got all of those tribes in their region. Mm. All so right. when you when you bring in that bee, it simply means that when you go to communities that have been sacked and are currently being occupied by these people, they will have a claim that likely a ranch will be the solution for that area or for the people to return. So practically we've had for over a decade clear case of terrorism being carried out under the cloak of pastoralism. And then because there has been a certain provision in our constitution, it makes it extremely difficult to actually proscribe these people as terrorists. And then it makes it possible to kill hundreds of indigents All without right. uh we are pressed for time, Zari. I mean, I, I would have uh, loved you to continue, but because uh, we, we are pressed for time, I, I'd like to quickly take uh, Abiodun's reactions, if at all, to some of the things you said. But uh, more importantly, is uh, some concerns, particularly um, concerns around uh, the payment for, you know, these ranches. Who we'll pays for it? These are private businesses. Should the state be responsible? you know, for, for, for uh, maintain, payment and also maintenance of this ranch, given the fact that, you know, uh, they are private businesses. And also, uh, the establishment of just uh, ranches themselves, you know, will it be at the uh, origin of uh, this people or the origin of trade? Yeah. Um, I think I must um, subscribe to what Zari said mm. um, in relation to um, the commission uh, to take over to decide how many ranches and all that needed in a state. In the first instance, it will not work. Just go and read uh, 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 the land use decree, you know, HAT, 1978, not domesticated. Go and read it. You will see that it will not work. The state government is in control of the land. Are you going to tell the governor of Benue State to allocate land for ranching? How? And you will be the one so to tell them. So how do you suggest them. they go about it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Look, run, cattle business is like any other business. There are poultry that's farmers right. who right. build poultry for them. Who is building poultry for but them? But this, uh, the yeah. reason why there's a lot of concern or focus on this one is because of the antecedent problem it has created. Hence, uh, uh, the need for government intervention. Yeah, absolutely. Is this idea of entitlement which is creeping in, that should be discouraged. I will agree, at least, after all, um, um, crop farmers do get some subvention on uh, fertilizer in the past, but it's subvention. It's not government buying the land, you know, for them to, to farm. No, you must own your land. It's the input that government do grant subvention, you know, on fertilizer to make it affordable. So in this case, it is the business of those who are grazing cattle mm to go and buy the land for ranching, and government can intervene one way or the other, either improve seedlings, you know, for uh, grass seedlings to plant. That is what they can do. They cannot go and build or pay for ranches or build um, um, uh, boreholes and all that for them. They can, government cannot do that. That would be wrong. That would be totally unacceptable. Who is helping the poultry farmers? If you want to start a poultry business, that is your own headache. Beef is not the only source of meat. It's not the only source of protein in Nigeria. Poultry is even a, a bigger business now. So who is helping them? So mm. I think we need to stop this culture of um, entitlement or uh, patronage, thinking that if we patronize, then that will be the solution. No, that will not be the okay. solution. It will only lead to another problem. OK. Uh, just uh, before we wind up, of course, on this uh, first half of the program, Zari, 30 seconds, your final comment. Yes, my final comment is that by all means, we must work hard to ensure that this particular bill does not sail through. Simple reason is because of particular provision in it that gives room and allowance for the commission to accept gifts, whether locally or internationally, and even under the terms of the donors, which simply means a whole lot, looking at what happens across the border, whether movement of uh, weapons and all of that. 
Now, that's quite dangerous. So I would just say that um, let not, let's not get carried away, especially with the ethno-religious background of the person presenting the bill. It is the same thing that Nigerians have rejected under Buhari's regime that is being repackaged and presented to us. That basically is what I have to say. And then ranching is strictly a private business. Ban in grazing and encourage people to go into ranching. Long story goes. It's a private business. The government doesn't have any business uh, right. building dams, constructing roads for people. Yes. All right, Zari, thank you so much for your input. Uh, Biodun Shoumi, and of course, uh, Zari Yusuf, uh, joining me on the conversation at this time. Once again, thank you for being on the program. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, uh, we'll go on a quick break. When we return, we will be going to South Africa, bringing you up to speed as regards the political climate there. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.